Hello, everybody. Welcome to the review class. If college could only have been this simple, life would have been very different. Okay, Mike, if you would lead us in uh, the mandala offering, please. Thank you. Dashi Puki Jukshin Me Tok Tron Rira Bling Shin Inde Gen Padi Sange Shin Du Mik Te Uwargi Jok Kun Nam Dak Shin La Chu Parshok Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niryatayami. Sange Chudong Zoki Choknam Chanchu Bardu Dakni Katsubchi Daki Jinsu Kipe Sunam Ki Drova Penchir Sange Drupar <clears throat> Sange Chudang Zoki Choknam Lang Chanchu Bardu Dakni Kyatsubchi Daki Jinsu Kipe Sunam Ki Drola Penchir Sange Drupar Sange Chudang Zoki Choknam Lang Chanchu Bardu Dakni Kyatsu Chi Daki Jinsu Kipe Sunam Ki Drola Penchir Sange Drupar Shul. <clears throat> okay, so review class. As I think I described before, the the finals taken from the quizzes, and the quizzes are taken from the homework. We go over the final. The, the point of the final is these are the most important things Gesh and Michael thought we should know from the class. So in order to make that, help, help that stick in your brain, we go through the answers. So there are no surprises, but it's not open book. So you do have to memorize or understand most of the uh, question. Most of them are very simple. There's only one or two that are long lists. But it is important to remember when we give a list, nine times out of 10, when you give a list in a Galupa teaching, the order is important. So let's dig right in. First question. Name the author of the principal teachings of Buddhism. Give both his popular name and his monk's name, as well as his dates. <clears throat> the author of the principal teachings of Buddhism was Jason Kapa. His dates are 1357-1419. His monk's name was Lobsang Drakpa, known as the pure-minded one from of wide renown. Number two, well, now, I think I mentioned before, it's important to know the teacher's name and it's important to know their dates. So when we when you have a class, as we go through you know, all the courses, you're gonna collect quite a bit of dates and name. So if I was it had to do all over again, I would start a list with course one what are the names and dates of the important teachers that are um, and, and works, name of the books? That way you don't have to go back and look it up later. <clears throat> so number two, what's the actual name of his work? The actual name of the work is The Three Principal Paths. Oops, something just happened. There we go. Okay, question number three. Who wrote the commentary that we're studying? Again, give both his popular name and his special name, 
what are his dates. The commentary we're studying was written by Pabonka Rinpoche, 1878 to 1941. His secret name was Denchen Ningpo, which means quicksilver. Very famous teacher, uh, incredible teachings. And look at his dates, 1941. That's pretty close. Well, used to be pretty close. <laughs> now I guess it's 100, almost 100 years ago. Okay, next. Question four. Who is the disciple of Trijong Rinpoche who wrote the introduction? Give his full name and correct title. The principal, the disciple of Trijong Rinpoche who wrote the introduction is Ken Rinpoche, Geshe Lobsang Tarchin. 1921, I believe he passed away in 20, in 2007, I don't remember. And he was Ken, uh, Ken Rinpoche, Keshe Lopsang Tarchin, was Keshe Michael Hartlong. Next, this is question number five. Name the three principal paths. Now this you have to have an order. Pretty simple, it's only a list of three. Renunciation, the wish for enlightenment, also known as bodhicitta, and the correct view of emptiness. So we talked about before this concept of Mahayana bodhicitta. So when you hear the wish for enlightenment, that is what bodhicitta means. It doesn't mean the wish for total enlightenment. The word bodhicitta means the wish for enlightenment. Mahayana bodhicitta, which is what we're studying and we hope to achieve, is a wish to, re to achieve total enlightenment for the benefit of all living beings. It can be confusing because they tend to interchange the term uh, throughout the courses. But when you see the word bodhicitta, it means enlightenment. If you see the term total enlightenment, that's Mahayana bodhicitta. Okay, next question. Question six, what are the two bodies of a Buddha? The two bodies of a Buddha are the physical body or part of an enlightened being known in Sanskrit as the Rupakaya and the combination of mental and ultimate nature parts of a Buddha in Sanskrit is known as the Dharmakaya. So if you just write down Rupakaya and Dharmakaya, that's sufficient. I mean, it's good to know the detail. Okay. Next, number seven. Name the causes of the two bodies. In our dedication, we talk about the collection of merit and wisdom, and that's the two ultimate bodies that merit and wisdom make. So here we the collection of wisdom is the cause for the wi Buddha's wisdom body. The collection of merit is the cause for the Buddha's form body. Which of the three principal paths, next question, number eight, which of the three principal paths cause each of the two bodies? Renunciation and the wish for enlightenment contribute primarily to the physical body or part of an enlightened being. Correct view refers primarily to the mental and ultimate nature parts of the Buddha. So again, renunciation of the wish for enlightenment contribute primarily to the Rupakaya, and the co correct view contributes primarily to the Dharmakaya.
Question 10. Name the 10 characteristics of a qualified Lama. This one's probably the hardest question on the exam, but just memorize it. That's uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. Number one, they should be a person who controls themselves well, meaning they practice the extraordinary training of an ethical way of life. So if you write down for A, they practice the extraordinary training of an ethical way of life, that's fine. B, they should be a person who is at peace, meaning they have achieved a great degree of extraordinary training of meditative concentration. C, they should be a person who has high peace, meaning they practice the extraordinary training of wisdom to a high degree. What do we mean by that? You watch your teacher, your lama, and you see that they are leading their practice what they're teaching. You can tell by what they're doing. They, they understand or have reasonable understanding of the idea of karma and emptiness and lead their lives knowing that their actions in this life are what's generating their future circumstances and their reaction to this life. Their reaction to the karmas from the past life are done with wisdom. They understand the past is the present and the present is the future. It's really important that, and obviously not only that you as a student, as a new Buddhist practitioner, follow these very thoughts and action, but you, you need to be able to, to see that your teacher is doing the same. Okay, D, they have spiritual qualities that succeed those of their students so they can help them. Now that's interesting. I don't know which of you could, any one of you, maybe all of you are Buddhas appearing to me as students. So to say that I have a higher uh, spiritual qualities than some of you might be a little far-fetched. The idea is you have confidence that I have, if I'm, if I, you consider me your Lama or as a teacher, you feel that I have knowledge that can be of help to you. If you don't feel that, then my teaching is not going to be of much value to you. E, they should be willing to make great efforts or take great joy in helping their students. They should like to teach. They, uh, they take questions. They answer the questions. They go out of their way to help their students study this material. F, they should be rich in scripture or have a deep knowledge of the sacred books. And I don't know that I have deep knowledge of the sacred books, but I know where to go and find information when I need it. They should have a deep, in a G, they should have a deep realization of such, suchness. I have not perceived emptiness directly. I believe I have a reasonable understanding of karma and emptiness. But I want to be clear, I have not seen emptiness directly. They should be a master instructor, meaning they know the student's capacity well and fit the amount and order of spiritual information to this capacity. If you don't ask me questions or any of your teachers questions about material you don't understand, and you're not allowing the teacher to try and help you with the subject matter. So it's really important to list your questions, ask your questions, email me with your question, I will get back to you as soon as I can. They should be the image of love, teaching the Dharma out of love for students and not for any other worldly motives. 
I teach because I enjoy bringing students into Buddhist practice. I've had the pleasure, the real pleasure of having several uh, dear students, uh, having introduced them to Buddhism, made a significant change in their life. That's, that's payment enough. That's all I'm looking for. Donations are fine, but if I can get any one of you interested in Buddhist practice, take all 18 courses, begin to teach the Dharma, possibly go into tantric practice, wow. I can't think of anything more satisfying than that. That's my motive, is to, is to help bring you into the Buddhist practice and help change your life. Jay, they should be beyond becoming discouraged, never tiring of repeating teaching if necessary for a student. I've said before, and I'll say it again, there's no such thing as a stupid question. To me, the stupid question is the one you don't ask that you really need an answer to. But I obviously, obviously I have no idea what that is because you haven't asked me. Now, if you ask me the same question over and over again, I may reach a point where I say, I've answered that question enough times. <laughs> Under, what, what don't you understand? What am I telling you that you don't understand? But that's rarely been ha happened to me. Okay. Next question, question 11. List the three requirements of a good student as found in Arya David's 400 verses. <clears throat> this isn't the three problems of the pot. So if you're a good student, you're free of preconceptions, willing to try to see things in a new way. Buddhism requires that a, a new student, a good student, be open-minded. There's quite a bit of material. <clears throat> well, just the idea of the concept of emptiness, karma and emptiness, requires an open mind. If you don't have an open mind trying to see things in a new way, karma and emptiness won't do anything for you. In fact, you'll reject it. So have an open mind. Understand that the world as we perceive it is not the world as it really is. It doesn't mean the world isn't out there and you're interacting with it. Karma and emptiness doesn't mean that I'm not here teaching. I am here teaching. But not because I'm self-existently here. It's because you have the karma and are projecting me as a teacher. That does not mean that I don't exist. Obviously I exist. I'm here teaching, you hear me talking. But I exist because of your karma ripening, not because I'm out here self-existently. Okay, the second point for a good student. They're intelligent, especially in a spiritual sense. To me, this means you're curious. You're intelligent in the sense that I don't understand something. How can I understand it better? Where can I read more about it? What kind of questions can I ask my teacher so that I fully understand what he or she's talking about? That's an intelligent student. Questioning what you're being taught. And third, they have high spiritual aspirations in life and are willing to work hard to reach them. These courses are not simple. We're going to get further down the line and they become more difficult. They require study. They require going over your notes, doing the homework, taking the time to then study and do the quiz and taking the time 
making time for doing the final. Working hard, putting off the homework to another day, not doing the final for a month, that's not working hard. That's being lazy in my opinion. I found, my lovely wife and I found that if you did the homeworks, as I've said before, we have class on Monday, you do the homework Monday night, Tuesday at the latest, take the quiz on Wednesday, and you're ready for class on Thursday. You're done with the previous class's material. If you don't do that, you end up at the end of the course with 10 homeworks to do, and you're never going to get to them. You're never going to take the final. Now, if you don't do the homeworks and quiz, I won't know. If you want to be a teacher, you really need to do that. If you're just listening to try and understand more about Buddhism, the point of the homeworks and quizzes and final is to drill the material in. It's the didactic approach to teaching, to study, to learning. I have some friends that are students that don't believe in the didactic way of doing this. They don't do the homeworks and quizzes. They don't do the final. That's their choice. But the requirement for getting into Tantra with Geshe Michael and Lama Christie was to have all of the courses done with homeworks and quizzes and finals done. So if you really want to, in my opinion, if you really want to get the most out of these 18 courses, do the homework, quizzes, and final, period. Okay, next question. That should be question 12. Define what is meant by cyclic life or samsara. The definition, which is a good one to memorize, the condition of being forced through the power of karma and mental afflictions to take on the impure parts that make up a suffering being over and over again. The condition of being forced through the power of karma and mental afflictions to take on the impure parts that make up a suffering being over and over again. Number 13, list the eight worldly thoughts. These are four pairs, so it might be easier to memorize the four positives and then just remember that the accompanying one is the opposite. So being happy when we acquire something. B, being un number two, being unhappy when we don't. <clears throat> being happy when we feel good and unhappy when we don't, being happy when we become well-known, and unhappy when we aren't well-known, being happy when someone speaks well of us, and being unhappy when they don't. So to make this real, let's just take a look at each one. Being happy when we acquire something. So for instance, for me, I purchase a new computer with more powerful. I have several monitors. I'm very happy with the layout. And then a month later, something goes wrong. And all of a sudden, I'm unhappy with my new purchase. That's a changing, the changing part of the suffering of change. If you're happy, then you're not. And this refers to ignorant, ignorant, happy, happy, ignorant liking, ignorant disliking, being unhappy when we feel good, being happy when we feel good, being unhappy when we don't, being happy when we become well known, being 
happy when we don't. I have a reasonable, uh, well, how can I put this? There are some people who think I'm a reasonable expert, a national expert on several weapon systems from a civilian standpoint. So that makes me happy. People respect me for my, my knowledge on the subject. And then someone doesn't refer to my books, and that makes me unhappy. And that's silly. I'm well known for one of my books, well, for actually several of them. But the fact that someone doesn't refer to my book shouldn't make me unhappy. It doesn't anymore. I was looking through one book. I wrote a book. My first book was about a particular weapon system that was deployed on submarines back in the 50s and early 60s. And I opened a book in a, in a bookstore once, a uh, complete history of United States submarines. And I leafed to the back and I looked up Growler and Grayback, two of the submarines I wrote about. And I looked at the page uh, that the index talked about. And I looked at the text. And I thought, this text really looks familiar. I wrote it. So I immediately went to the back of the book and looked to see what the uh, credits were, what the bibliography was. And in this book, it was about this thick, really nicely done, published by a well-known publishing house. In the back, there were three books that were in the bibliography, and one of them was mine. So it went from being, oh, these guys copied stuff, they didn't give me credit, to being one of the few, one of the three books that they referenced in the entire history of U.S. submarines. So I had the, the happiness of, I had the unhappy that they didn't recognize me, and then I had the happy that they did recognize me. So that was pretty silly. Because if I thought carefully about it, this was back before I was a Buddhist, and I didn't think much about this kind of thing. Okay. Being unhappy when someone speaks well, being happy when someone speaks well of us, being unhappy when they don't. I don't know how many of you have had this experience, but there's a phrase I like to remember as often in my life. The surest way to puncture a pleasure is to over-anticipate its occurrence. So if you really want to, someone to, you're looking for someone to thank you or speak well of you, and they do, sometimes you don't think they did it nicely enough. They're thanking you. They're recognizing you. You get pleasure out of it, but it's not being done the way you think it should be. That's overthinking it. If someone thanks you for something, accept it. Don't worry about whether it was done the way you think it should have been done. Over anticipating its occurrence. So the eight worldly thoughts, one more time. Being happy when we acquire something, being happy when we feel good, being happy when we become well-known, and being happy when someone speaks well of us. If you remember those four, then the others that go with them are being unhappy, being unhappy, being unhappy, and being unhappy. Really simple to memorize that. Okay. 
Okay, number 14. This is, this is critical. You need to memorize this in the correct order, period. The four principles of action are the four laws of karma. Actions are certain to produce similar results. A good deed produces a pleasant result. A bad deed produces an unpleasant result. The consequences are greater than the actions. I think I said back when we were teaching this that I they they talk about the power of the karma doubles every 24 hours. And the example they use is if you crush a fly at the end of the month, it's like killing an elephant. Well, I looked into this, and I'm not saying that that isn't correct. What I am saying, I'm saying, yes, karma grows. But I looked and looked and looked, and the only place I found reference to a doubling every 24 hours was in a text on Vajragini Tantra by Pavonka Rinpoche. Now, I'm not saying, certainly I'm not saying he's wrong, but I asked that Halarampa Geshe, uh, one of the very, very well-educated, highly educated monks, and I asked him about this doubling every 24 hours, and he said, David, the idea is it increases quickly. Whether it doubles every 24 hours isn't the point. The point is that it increases daily. See, one cannot meet a consequence if he or she has not committed the action. Very simple. You can't collect someone else's karma. They can't collect yours. We talk about rejoicing in the future. We'll talk about rejoicing in other people's good deeds. That's different than believing you can take on their karma. Once an action is committed, rule number law number five, once an action is committed, the consequent cannot be lost. Now that's interesting. If you once an action is committed, the consequence cannot be lost. The, the key word there is consequence. There are the four powers of purification we talked about. Taking refuge, regret, restraint, and remedy. And what that does is in our description, our analogy, it damages the karmic seed so that it can't come to full fruition. So if you do the four powers of purification after you do something that you realize was wrong, it doesn't mean that karma won't ripen. But what it does mean is it will ripen in a lesser manner. For instance, just as an example, you chop someone's head off because you were an executioner 15 lives ago. You do the four powers of purification and it ripens in another life as a headache. It's an extreme example, but it still ripens. The point of it, with that example or not, the point of it is the karmic actions never lost. The consequence cannot be, consequence cannot be lost, but it can be mitigated. That doesn't mean go out and do bad things and then do a four powers of purification thinking it won't ripen. It still will ripen. And depending on how well you do your four powers of purification will depend on if it, how, how lesser the, uh, the deed is. Okay, next. At what point do we know we've developed true renunciation? 
when you think of nine day of achieving freedom and having no and no longer have any attraction to the so-called good things in this life. So let's take a no, let's not do that. Throw the verse out of the three principal laughs. When you begin to think no, both nine day of achieving freedom, you have found renunciation. So what is true renunciation? Does true renunciation mean that you give up your family, you give up your job, you go live in a cave? No. True renunciation means you begin to look at your life, you begin to see where you can improve on your goals. You don't worry about working overtime to get another car or a fancy television. You're satisfied with what you have, and you now start to focus on the important things. That doesn't mean with a family, you give up. But if you have a family, you have very powerful karmic objects, your spouse, your children, extremely powerful karmic objects. You can practice your Buddhist practice with them. It's very powerful. Through renunciation, let's see of an example for me. I had a good one a while back. Through renunciation. Now I can't think of one now. Well, here's a good example. We had the opportunity to move into a much fancier house than the house we, no, well, this is an even better example. We had a beautiful house on three acres of land in the foothills of the Tucson mountains. Absolutely beautiful home. We loved it. But we knew it was on the far side of Tucson. It was only another 45 minutes to get to Diamond Mountain when we started working there. We realized that two people didn't need 2,300 square feet of house and three acres, as beautiful as it was. So we renounced, we did a, a renunciation. We moved into a much smaller condo on the other side of Tucson so we were much closer to Diamond Mountain. Our renunciation was giving up an absolutely beautiful house on three beautiful acres and moved into a condominium in Tucson. Okay. Give an explanation of the two parts of the word bodhicitta. Does it refer to the mind of a Buddha? Bodhi means enlightenment or Buddhahood, and chitta means thoughts. Together, the words mean the wish to become enlightened. Now, the answer key has in brackets for every living being, and that's correct, because as I said earlier, the wish to become enlightened. Bodhicitta has nothing to do with saving every living being unless it's Mahayana Bodhicitta. But the term Bodhicitta just means the wish to become enlightened. It does not mean Bodh Buddha mind in the sense that we already have reached Buddhahood or mind that is somehow already enlightened and only needs to be seen as enlightened. The wish to become enlightened the wish to have a, body, a Buddha mind, but it doesn't mean it's here to be uncovered. It means I can achieve it, but it's not here to be uncovered. There's no little Buddha in my chest that I just have to uncover.
number 17. I think I skipped one. Let me go back. I'm pretty sure I skipped one. Well, apparently I didn't. Sorry about that. Okay, next is question 18, 17. Give the seven steps in the cause and effect method for developing the wish for enlightenment. <clears throat> so this is the seven step method we talked about. The first one, the, the seven steps have a first step, which is equanimity treating all people the same. So the second step, the first of the seven, is to recognize that all living beings have been your mother. You need to treat all living beings the same, not holding some close and others distant. Need to see everybody as your mother. And remember the kindness they gave you when they were your mother. The first step leads to this one because if you do not see everyone as having been your mother in the past, then you do not see everyone as being kind. Excuse me for a minute. I'll be right back. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, where were we? Okay, let's do that. Let's start over. Recognize all living beings as having been your mother. You need to treat everybody the same as your kind mother, deserving your ultimate help. <clears throat> Remember the kindness they gave you, step number two when they were your mother. Remember, they took care of, they, they bore you for nine months. They wanted to underwent the pain of childbirth. They lived with the fact that they were gaining weight, the weight of you growing. They needed to be careful what they ate. They needed to change their lifestyle as they were carrying you. They sacrificed a lot. Then you just, number three, you decide to repay the kindness of your mother. <clears throat> Second step leads to this one. So if you believe to treat all people as your mother, you remember the kindness. If you remember the kindness, you would you feel a debt 
and you decide to repay the kindness of your mother. But in order to do that, you never need to remember the kindness. You have to believe in the kindness. D, love all people with the intensity of a mother for her only child. Now, that's interesting that it says mother for their only child. I would say a mother would have the kind of the love that she has for all her children. I'm not sure why it's the only child, maybe because that's so incredibly precious. But I would think if you have lots of kids, they're all equally precious to you. So love all people with the intensity of a mother for her children who wish that they could have every good thing. Feel great compassion for all living beings. Want them to be free of suffering. Decide to help everyone even after you have to do it all yourself. And the last one is a wish, achieve the wish to become enlightened for the sake of every living being. So let's go through those again. First, see all, treat all people equally. That's hard to do because our culture says, emphasizes liking and disliking people. Uh, former President Trump is a great example of not doing this. He hates people. He speaks poorly of people. He's not treating them all as if they'd been his mother. Think how wonderful this world would be if everybody did this. Once you remember the kindness they gave you, You decide to repay the kindness. You love all people with the intensity of a mother for her children. Feel great compassion for all living beings. Want them to be free from the suffering that you're experiencing. And decide you're going to take care of this, even if you have to do it yourself without being discouraged if no one helps you. And to make all this happen, to really make this happen and be of value, be powerful, you need to have the aspiration to become enlightened for the sake of every living being. That's your, your incentive. If you really want to accomplish all of what we just talked about, you have to become a totally enlightened being to truly help them. It's not that you can't help them without becoming enlightened. That's not the point. The point is if you really want to powerfully help them, really help them, you have to become totally enlightened. On the way to doing that, you help them as best you can. And that's still extremely powerful. That's, it's powerful because in doing that, you're collecting the virtue to become enlightened. If you want to become enlightened for the benefit of all beings, but you don't do things like this seven-step cause and effect, you're never going to collect the virtue necessary to see emptiness directly and get on the path toward total enlightenment. There are no shortcuts. Some would say Tantra is a shortcut. Wait till you get into Tantra to see that it's not the uh, shortcut you might think it is. Name the two truths and describe them briefly. Ultimate truth and deceptive truth. Ultimate truth is very simply the emptiness of all things. The emptiness of all things means the fact and not anything which is not a projection forced on you by your karma. Everything in your world, everything is a result of your karma ripening 
in your response to it, period. Deceptive truth refers to the normal objects around you, which seem to exist from their own side or have some nature of their own, but they don't. So it's deceptive. It seems like seeing a mirage. It looks like there's a lake in front of you or an ocean, but there isn't. It's deceptive. So everything you see, like me right now, is not that I'm not here. It's that I'm here because of your projections, not because I'm self-existently here. That's a tough thing to grasp, and it's difficult to that's one thing you're going to cook for the rest of your 18 courses, and maybe for the rest of your life. Okay. Number 19. I did skip one. I'll get back. I'll get to it in just a minute. Explain what interdependence means, also known as dependent origination. This one's a little long and complicated. So there are three schools we're going to talk about. The functionalist group, things are interdependent in the sense that changing things depend on their causes and conditions. This group consists of three classic Buddhist schools of ancient India. The detailists, so this, the functionalist group are composed of the detailists, the sutrists, and the mind-only school. This is something you really do need to memorize and, and understand. The functionalist group is made up of the detailists, also known as the Abhidharma school, the sutrist or logic, also known as the detailists, and the mind-only school. So they believe things depend on their causes and conditions. The independent group, things are interdependent in the sense that all objects, changing or unchanging, depend on their parts. This consists of the half, half of the middle way or Majamika school, known as the independent or Svatantrika group. The implication group is the last one. Things are interdependent in the sense that they are a result of our projecting onto a basis of our projections. This is the ultimate meaning of interdependence. We'll be going through this again and again. So if this is still sort of muddy to you, I would suggest looking at and memorizing class nine Question number two, look at the answer for that. I'll tell you what, I will send you, I will send you the answer key for the homework. And it's marked up with the questions that are on the final. So I will send you that after class. Okay, number 20. Buddhism teaches that no self, in quotes, exists. Give a description of this non-existent self or self-nature, according to Master Chandrakirti. A self, in quotes, or me, does exist. There is someone who is reading you these homework, these answers to the final right now. But there is no self or me which exists from its own side, independent of the projections forced upon me by my karma, forced upon you by your karma. So the no self isn't saying I don't exist. The no self means I don't exist in the way I thought I existed. You really have to grasp that. When we say there's no self, we're not saying you don't exist. We're saying you don't exist in the way you think you exist. 
very important to grasp that. Okay, the last question. Can the idea of karma, that is ethics or morality, coexist with the idea of emptiness? This is where the analogy of the two sides of the same coin comes in. Things are empty in the sense of being like a blank screen. Whether I see them one way or another depends on my own projection forced upon me by my past words and deeds. Therefore, karma and emptiness are completely intertwined. And anyone who understands emptiness understands the need to be absolutely moral in their everyday life. Yes, the idea of karma not only can coexist, but does coexist with the idea of emptiness. Okay, now there was one question I believe I skipped. Let me get back to it. Just take me a minute to find it. Okay, it's question number nine on the home, on the final. Is there any re a relationship between the three principal paths and tantric practice? Tantric practice can only be successful based on the three principal paths. Tantric practice is based fully on the three principal paths, so much so that without them, one can never be successful in tantric practice. But with them, one will almost automatically succeed in tantra. So that's the final. We've gone through each of the questions. I will send you, what I've done is I've taken all the homeworks and I've marked on them in highlight which questions are on the final. So that should help you study for the final, make it easier to study for the final. Okay. So. This is the end of ACI course one. I congratulate you on taking the course. I hopefully, those of you that are interested in teaching have done the homeworks and quizzes and will get the final done. We will start course two, I believe. Let me just make sure, check my calendar. I think Mike has a question. I'm sorry, say that again. Mike, do you have a question? I do. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so for the functionalist, independent, and implication um, uh, definitions of interdependence, um, we're not saying that neither we're not saying that anyone in particular is wrong per se they're just not complete right. so like That's, so like yeah. functionalists like they're right like everything is dependent on their causes it's in conditions and in, inter and independent is right because everything is made up of parts but it's it's they're just not going far enough with their explanation so they're correct in their in what they're saying but they're just not including the concept of uh karma projecting onto emptiness right precisely okay that's very well put mike yeah you're often when we say lesser medium or greater scope 
I don't like the terms lesser and medium and greater because it, it seems to imply that they're not as good. They're not as complete. But are they wrong? No, they're just not as complete. So is a functionalist group wrong and thinks that thinking things are independent, interdependent because they depend on causes and conditions? No, that's absolutely true. But it's not the complete story. And same with the independent group. So when we talk about lesser or greater, it's always important to not look at that as derogatory, as it is so much describing the comprehensiveness, the completeness of the that particular group or school. So a lesser, the lesser scope wants to stay out of lower rebirth. That's great. That's much better than not worrying about it, not being concerned about it. Then the medium scope doesn't want to be reborn at all. And the greater scope not only doesn't want to go to the lesser realms, lower realms, not only doesn't want to be reborn in samsara, but wants to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. So there, there has to be, a, there, there must be a better term, better terms, but I can't come up with them. And that's not how the Buddhist, how Buddhism is taught. They talk about lesser, medium, greater. Thank you for the honor of teaching you this introductory material. I hope that you all come and start course two. And course two, I believe, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. But I think we said course two was going to start on the 28th. I have on my calendar ACI course two, class one, starts on the 28th, which is, wow, well, it's only a week from today. Hmm. Well, that means you have to get your final done pretty quickly. <laughs> okay. Let me just check, right? I think the reason we said we'd start so quickly was because there are teachings coming up by Geshe Michael. Yeah. Okay. We'll see you all then. Let's do our closing prayer, our dedication. We've just done a wonderful thing taking these 10 classes in this review class. It's a start for some of you on your Buddhist journey. I'm honored to have been part of that start and look forward to teaching you in further classes. By the goodness of what we've just done, may all beings complete the collection of merit and wisdom and thus gain the two ultimate bodies that merit and wisdom make. Okay. I know starting the second class, the second course is right on the heels of this. I apologize for that, but I have a vow not to teach while my teacher's teaching. And so if we didn't do this, it was going to extend into when Keshe Michael's teaching his next course at Diamond Mountain. And I didn't want that to happen. So the incentive is to get your final done in the next week, please. Okay. See you a week from today. Bye-bye. Oh, there's some chat. Oh, you're all welcome. It's my pleasure. Okay. 
Bye bye. Well, maybe we'll see some of you on the uh, death meditation this coming weekend. Bye bye.